Okay, Shabbat Shalom family. Before we start, I want to make sure that everything is fine, both with the audio as well as the video. And once that's established, we'll get directly into our Q&A. Okay, wonderful. Someone confirmed that the audio is fine. Okay, loud and clear. All right, perfect. At this time, since it is the Sabbath, we will begin with our Shema. Uh, for those who are new to our broadcast or are new to our lessons or new to the, I guess you would say, the uh, Hebrew experience altogether, uh, what we're about to recite is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 in Hebrew. I'll read it here first in the English. And then afterwards, I'll recite it in Hebrew. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 tells us the following. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Again, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So we're going to recite this in Hebrew, and then afterwards, we're going to get right into our Q&A segment. Shemai Yasha'ala Ahaya Alahayanawa Ahaya Akkad. Shemai Yasha'ala Ahaya Alahayanawa Ahaya Akkad. Shemai Yasha'ala Ahaya Alahayanawa Ahaya Akkad. Here... O Israel, the Lord our God is one. All right. First and foremost, praise and honor to the Most High, Ahaya Bahashim Yashai Wabrawak, for allowing us to come before you for another Sabbath. Uh, we also want to thank him for his mercy and his grace for allowing us all to enter into another Sabbath. And uh, today, of course, um, uh, we are going to be dealing with a Q&A segment, uh, and if it be the Lord's will next week, um, Elder Akashiar will be back, and we will be doing a powerful lesson through the Spirit of the Most High, if it's his will. Uh, also, just want to notify you all that this coming Wednesday, we will be on Blog Talk Radio with a very powerful and informative broadcast uh, for those this past Wednesday. Uh, we know that that was one of the most insightful, one of the most informative, one of the most eye-opening um, broadcast that we've had uh, in some time. And, you know, every week, of course, it's it's very good information. But, and things of that nature, uh, I think that particular broadcast uh, was an eye-opener for many uh, to understand what our people are uh, dealing with, what they're struggling with um, on the dark side side, those who are operating, trying to find their way spiritually, uh, but based on um, falling into the same traps of our forefathers, they find themselves uh, dealing in all forms of witchcraft and sorcery, um, divinations, and uh, things that the Bible condemns um, explicitly uh, through through the precepts and through the, the laws and scriptures of the Bible, okay? So this coming week, we're going to be carrying on uh, with the uh, in that same vein of spiritual warfare and things of that nature this coming Wednesday, uh, if it be the Lord's will. OK. Uh, someone says, have you guys talked with Pastor Timothy again? Uh, the pastor elder did a broadcast with um, we have not spoke. Well, me personally, I haven't spoken with him since. Um, Elder Rakar Shah may have had an opportunity to speak with him since we have had the broadcast. Uh, but usually with those situations, sometimes you want to give people some time to kind of sit back and reflect and think upon the information that they have received. Um, as, as the scriptures tell us, um, the information, in fact, let me get it here in the book of Proverbs. I don't want to misquote it. Okay, 
Uh, we're going to go to the book of Proverbs because it's a very wise scripture uh, when it comes to information. OK, uh, also the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, Give some very wise. OK, uh, information uh, or wise scriptures uh, when it comes to receiving information. OK, so first we're going to go to Proverbs chapter 24, verse 13, where it tells us, my son, eat thou honey because it is good and the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste. Uh, we're going to find out that honey in the Bible, in some instances, is a metaphor for knowledge and understanding. Verse uh, 14 within the book of Proverbs chapter 24 tells us the following. It says, so shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul. So here we see the comparison between honey and knowledge or honey and wisdom. Now let's go over to the book of Proverbs chapter 25, verse 16. It says, has thou found honey? Meaning, has thou found knowledge? Eat so as much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomited. Meaning what? Information sometimes is best given in small, short doses. Uh, sometimes there's a such thing, and many of you have experienced this, uh, coming into the truth. You receive the truth. You receive the information uh, with joy. But you try to go and take the same information to someone else, and you try to give them everything at once, and it scares them off. Okay? Or even some of you initially, when you received a lot of the different teachings and you saw some of the things that we were bringing forward, initially, the information was too much at once to bear. Okay? So it's the same thing with, you know, sometimes when we share information, we have to be mindful as teachers that we have to give people time to allow the information to resonate and for them to actually digest what they have received. So again, the Bible says, has thou found honey, meaning has thou found knowledge, has thou found wisdom, eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomited. Okay? There's a such thing as an information overload. Okay? Uh, when you go to Ecclesiastes, I believe it's 1 and 11. Let me get it here. In fact, let me get it. Uh, yes, 1 and 18. Ecclesiastes in the Bible, chapter 1, verse 18 states, For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. So with the more knowledge and the more understanding you increase, of course, with that comes sorrow. As uh, the prophet Ezekiel uh, stated that he was told to eat a roll. I believe also John the Revelator in the book of uh, Revelations, the fifth chapter, he was also commanded to eat a scroll. When he consumed the scroll, it was like honey for sweetness in his mouth, but was like bitterness unto his belly. Okay, so yes, it's joyful when you first receive information, but when you sit back and you allow it to resonate and you really think about what this means, understanding that unto whom is given, much is required, that's when the sorrow comes in. Okay? So um, I say that to say that, um, you know, our next conversation, hopefully with Brother Pastor Timothy, would be a conversation that he initiates with a desire um, to... Uh, speak more concerning uh, the truth, the gospel, and uh, based on the conversation we did have with him on the radio show, um, he is on the right path when it comes to uh, certain aspects of the gospel. So you have to give people time. Okay. Let's go back to get some of these questions. Let me go back and see if I skipped any questions at the top. Uh, 
All right. Someone says, is there a GOCC in Columbus, Ohio? Uh, the answer is yes. All right. What you can do is send an email to GOCCNYC at gmail.com. Uh, requesting information for fellowship in Ohio. Again, GOCCNYC at yahoo.com. All right. When do we expect the Orlando body to be ready? Uh, we are currently looking for a building in Orlando. So as soon as we find a building uh, that suits that's suitable uh, for uh, the amount of people that we currently have in Orlando, uh, then we'll we'll start the the ball rolling as far as fellowship uh, in the Orlando area. Uh, someone says, uh, my video is skipping. Are there still I uh, issues with the video? All right. I want to check to make sure that uh, the video is fine. Okay. Someone says uh, their video is fine. Okay, good. Uh, someone says, do you talk with Lahab, former elder of ISUPK, since Elder Gabar spoke with him last time? Um, the answer is no. Okay. Uh, someone says, can you break down the five golden emeralds and the five golden mice? Okay. Uh, I believe that's, are you, you're referring to the book of Okay. Let me correct that. Uh, the book of first Samuel. Okay. First Samuel, the fifth chapter. All right. In fact, I'll read it here. Uh, First Samuel, chapter five, verse one. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set it in his place. And when they arose on the early morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon, and both of the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor any that came into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and ashed out unto this day. Verse six. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them at Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. So. The Most High God plagued the Philistines and their cities with the curse of Emirates. Okay. Verse number seven. And when the men of Ashdod saw it, uh, saw that it was so, they said, the ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. They sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they said, let the ark of the God of Israel be carried about unto Goth. And they carried the ark of the God of Israel about thither. And so it was that when they carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city and very great destruction. 
And he smote the city or the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emeralds and their secret parts. Okay. Now, when you look up emeralds, I'm going to pull it up here. Okay. I'm going to pull up emeralds with a Bible dictionary just so we can get the understanding of what they are. Then we're going to answer the question as far as uh, why uh, did they make or create uh, golden emeralds as well as the five golden mice? Okay. You're going to find out that the Most High cursed uh, the cities of the Philistines. One second here. All right, I'm trying to pull up the Bible dictionary here, but it's it's malfunctioning. So just one moment. Okay, so this is from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. It states, okay, emeralds, the Hebrew word is ipalium. Uh, these words are used in account of the plague which broke out amongst the Philistines while a captive of the ark while the captive Ark of the Covenant was in their land. Ophelim or Alpayim literally means rounded eminences or swellings, and in the standard revised version is translated as tumors. Okay. Now, in some places they translate it as hemorrhoids, or what we call today hemorrhoids. Okay, the emeralds. So getting back to the story. Okay, in fact, I'm going to try to pull it up here. All right, then we're going to get back to the story and explain the five golden emeralds and the five golden mice. All right, while this is pulling up, I'll read verse number 10 where it says, Therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron, and it came to pass, as the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, that the Ekronites cried out saying, they have brought about the ark God of the God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go again to his own place, that it slay us not and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men of that city died and were smitten with emeralds and went up to heaven. Okay, now let's get the uh, the making of the golden emeralds and the mice. I'm going to go over to chapter number six. We're going to start at verse one. It says, and the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priest and the diviner saying, what shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. And they said, if we send away the ark of the God of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering, then ye shall be healed and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Verse four, key verse. Then said they, what shall be the trespass offering which we shall return to him? And they answered, five golden emeralds and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For one plague was on you all and on all your lords. So there were five lords of the Philistines, five cities of the Philistines, and therefore as a gift to the Israelites to whom they would return the Ark of the Covenant, they gave them five golden mice and five golden emeralds. Verse number five says, when ye shall make images of your emeralds and images of your mice, so these weren't real mice wrapped in gold or real emeralds, wrapped in gold, these were just similitudes or images 
of emeralds and mice. And images of your mice that mar your land. So this is where the mice come in at. The men themselves were plagued with emeralds or hemorrhoids or with swellings, okay? And also their cities were plagued with mice, okay? So that was the significance of the mice. And ye shall give glory unto the God of Israel. Per adventure, he will lighten his hand from off you and from off your gods and from off your land. Okay. Now let's go to the book of Judges 3 and 3 real quick. Uh, just to show that the city of the Philistines was known for having five lords. It goes here in the book of Judges chapter 3 verse number 2. Uh, or yes, Judges 3 and 2, it says, only that generation of the children of Israel might know to teach them war at the least such as before knew nothing thereof, namely five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwell in the Mount Lebanon from Baal Hermon unto the entering in of Hamath. So the city of the Philistines was known for having five lords. Hence, when they sent the gift to the Israelites, they made the five golden emeralds and the five golden mice. Okay. Hopefully that answers your question. We're going to go to some more questions here. Maybe let me close some of the tabs I have up. It'll probably give me, probably help me out here. Uh, someone says, what happens to your personal angels after the body dies? That information I'm not sure of. Okay. I can speculate, but my, my speculation would serve you no purpose um, as it pertains to that particular topic. Okay. Now, some people may be asking, well, what do you mean by a personal angel? Uh, well, to uh, get that understanding, we're going to go to the gospel. Okay. I'm going to go to the book of the Gospels. And let's see what Christ had to say concerning uh, what the world may call a uh, guardian angel, which we have to be very careful with that concept of guardian angel. Because uh, what the world refers to as a guardian angel and what you may hear people uh, dealing with, especially in the occult. Um, a lot of that is dealing with what you call spirit guides, what they call spirit guides or what the Bible calls familiar spirits. OK, uh, these are spirits or as they call them, guardian angels, which do your bidding in the earth or reveal unto you information, so on and so forth. Um, that's not what the Bible is dealing with. OK, the Bible is specifically and I'm going to read it um, actually from the words of Christ himself. OK. In the New Testament. OK, let me get it here. One moment. Okay, Matthew 18, okay. Book of Matthew chapter. 
And we're going to start in verse number eight. Uh, we're going to start in verse 10. Okay, in fact, let's start up a few verses because there's a deep spiritual message um, that Christ uh, relays in this chapter, Matthew 18. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse number one. At the same time came the disciples unto Yeshua, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Yeshua called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and be as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Wherefore, therefore, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one, such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Verse 7. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs that uh, it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom offenses come, or by whom the offenses offenses come. Um, so a lot of people become discouraged uh, when offenses take place, not realizing that offenses have a purpose. In fact, Christ himself said, it must needs be that offenses come, but woe unto that man by whom the offenses come. So yes, there is a judgment for one who offends the little ones of Christ, but nonetheless, those offenses will and must come. As the Bible states that these, these things are like a, a trying unto our faith. When you go to the book of uh, 1 Corinthians 11, it says that heresies must come so that they who are among you may be approved. So all of the, I guess you would say, the downsides or the bad sides of the truth, such as heresies and offenses and things of that nature, these are things we, we hate to have to deal with, but they are necessary for the trying of our faith. Uh, jumping to the key point in verse number 10, it says, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you, that in heaven <clears throat> their angel doeth behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. Okay? So you have angels who go and report before the Father the workings of individuals, the workings of people. Okay, some people refer to them as guardian angels, but again, you have to be very uh, careful uh, with that particular terminology, because if you go and research that term using that term, guardian angel, it may lead you down a wrong path. It may lead you into trying to find out uh, who is your spirit guide, okay? Uh, who is your guardian angel? And uh, how can you receive information from your guardian angel? Uh, how can you find out about your aunt who died seven years ago and, and things of that nature? These are the things you're going to run into when you search guardian angel. But I'm, I'm simply using that term as something that some of you may have heard of, may be familiar with, um, as far as a, a angel, a power from, from the heavenly realm, beholding and taking account of works on a daily basis. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> let's go over to the book of Okay, let's go over to the book of let's say 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, and it starts off dealing with head coverings, the importance or the, the spiritual wisdom pertaining to head coverings. Uh, it goes on, uh, let me get to the point, uh, verse number 10, 1 Corinthians 11 and uh, verse number 10. For this cause, ought the woman to have power over her head or on her head because of the angels. In other words, there are angels who watch. There are angels who take account of the daily task and the daily workings, 
that take place in the earth. Okay, uh, we find examples of this when we go to the, for example, the book of Job. Okay, before we get the book of Job, we're going to go to the book of Psalms, chapter 82, verse 1. It says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, he judgeth among the gods. What is this showing? This is showing us an example of the heavenly council that takes place between the Most High and the angelic forces, the spiritual forces. Again, it says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods, the powers, the Elohims, the Allahayim. Okay, what are these again? Well, this scripture is showing an example of the heavenly council that takes place in the spiritual realm. The book of Job shows an exa example of Satan going before that heavenly council. Okay, the book of Job chapter one, verse number six. And it says, now there was a day when the sons of God, who are the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. Okay, so the angels, they go, they present themselves before the Lord and they give an account again of the daily workings that take place, okay? Uh, before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, which comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. So not only are the heavenly angels, the righteous angels who work under the command of the Most High, not only are they taking account of what takes place in the earth, but Satan is also taking account. OK, as it says in first Peter five and eight, I believe, where it says that uh, he's like a roaring lion that goeth about seeking whom he may devour. Let me get that real quick. And then just one more scripture on this particular topic before we move on to our next question. First Peter, chapter five, verse eight, I believe. Let me get it here. Yes. First Peter five and eight. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, goeth about or walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So he also goes to and fro in the earth. Okay. Which, for example, the Bible says, hold that thought because we're going to get back to that thought in 1 Peter 5 and 8. But just showing a, an example of how he mimics the order of the Most High. Okay. He mimics the order of the Most High. So an example of that is, let's go to the book of Proverbs. Let's see here. The book of Proverbs. All right, let me get it here. Just bear with me. All right, let me pull it up here. Okay. Because the Bible speaks about the eyes of the Lord. Who are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Let me get it here. All right. Yes, Proverbs 15, verse number three, okay? Proverbs 15 and three tells us that the eyes of the Lord, who are the angels, are in every place beholding the evil and the good. So the same way you have angels who report back to the Most High who are uh, beholding the evil and the good, Satan also is operating along with his angels, beholding the evil and the good. OK, and what he did before Christ was crucified, uh, according to Revelation 12, is that he would go into the heavenly council, as he did in the book of Job, the first chapter. And he would uh, he would be an adversary and he would accuse the brethren before the father. OK, but as it tells us in Revelation 12, let me get it real quick. Revelation chapter 12, verse number seven. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels showing you that Satan also has his 
uh, heavily body of angels, of spirits, of demons that work under his command. Okay. Uh, as it says in, um, uh, something just came to mind, but I'll, I'll get back to it. It says here in verse number seven, uh, Satan fought and his angels or, or and the dragon and his angels fought. Uh, and it says in verse eight, and prevailed not, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So no longer could they go before the father and the heavenly council and accuse the brethren before the father. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world and was cast out into the earth and his angels with them were, were cast out with him. Again, showing you that Satan also has his heavenly body that's the point I wanted to make, as it says in Isaiah 14, that he, he made a promise to be like the Most High. So in every aspect of Satan's workings, he tries to replicate, uh, he tries to mimic the works of the Most High. So again, the Most High has his angels, which go throughout reporting the evil and the good. Satan has his angels, which go about, and they seek out whom they may devour. They seek out both the evil and the good. We see an example of Job, who was a good man, who Satan went before the father and accused Job before the father, asked the father for permission to uh, begin to plague and persecute Job. And he also beholds the evil of mankind. Okay. The scriptures go into that also. Uh, Matthew, the 12th chapter, uh, when it speaks about a spirit uh, which has been cast out going into dry places and he seeketh a place of rest, but findeth none. Then he goes back to the place uh, which he once called his home, which is a body, a vessel that he can use to fulfill his lust, speaking about the demon. And when he finds it swept and garnished, he, he takes uh, on seven demons, more powerful, more wicked than himself, and he takes hold of that vessel. Okay? So they also are going about throughout the four corners of the earth, to and fro on the earth, as it says in the book of Job, the first chapter, beholding the evil and the good. Uh, so <clears throat> that's just a few scriptures to, uh, to get to the point of showing um, how the angels operate. Some people may have on that uh, when it comes to the angels reporting and, you know, how does that work within this physical realm? Um, uh, some people may have questions of, uh, what are the the workings and the machinations of the invisible amongst the visible? And the answer is absolutely yes. You do have the invisible operating around us on a daily basis. Okay, the spiritual realm is operating amongst us on a daily basis. And within that spiritual realm, again, last time I'm going to make this point before we move on. Within that spiritual realm, you have angels who are going about and reporting everything that is done on earth. Okay. So going back to Matthew to close this off in Matthew, the 18th chapter in the 10th verse. It says, take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven, their angel doeth always behold the face of my father which is in heaven. Okay. So hopefully that, that answered your, well, of course we didn't answer the question as far as what happens to those, those particular angels once you pass on. But, um, we did answer the question concerning how those angels actually operate, um, within the course of the earth. Uh, someone says, what happens if you do a lot of alms but continue to sin? Um, well, let's see. Okay, let's go to the book of 1 Samuel 15. And I'm assuming this is, this is coming from the concept, of course, uh, the Bible says that charity covereth a multitude of sins. In fact, let's get that verse um, out of the uh, New Testament. I believe that's Timothy, if I'm not mistaken, either Timothy or Peter. Let me get it here. Yes, First Peter 4 and 8. Uh, and above all things, have fervent charity among, 
among yourselves, for charity, which is love, uh, covereth a multitude of sins. Uh, also, the book of Tobit speaks extensively of uh, the giving of alms, okay, and how alms delivereth from death. Okay, let me get one of those excerpts from the book of Tobit. Then we're going to go into the Bible to see what happens if uh, you continue to give alms, but at the same time you continue uh, to sin, which is a transgression of the Most High's law. Okay. Uh, this is the book of Tobit, chapter 4, uh, verse number, I'll start in verse number 7. Okay, and again, the book of Tobit speaks extens extensively. When you go into other chapters of Tobit, it also speaks of alms. But I'm going to go here in verse number seven, where it says, or in verse number six, it says, For if thou do truly, thy doings shall be prosperously or shall prosper prosperously succeed to thee and to all them that live justly. Give alms of thy substance, and when thou givest alms, let not thy eye be envious. Neither turn thy face from any poor, and the face of God shall not be turned away from thee. If thou hast substance, give alms accordingly. If thou hath but a little, be not afraid to give according to that little. For thou layest up a good treasure for thyself against the day of necessity, because that alms doeth deliver from death, and suffer not to come into darkness. For alms is a good gift unto all that give it in the sight of the Most High. And you have many people who read this and they say, well, based on this, the book of Tobit uh, is not a good record because it teaches against the Bible. It tells you that alms uh, delivers from death and therefore that is a Roman Catholic doctrine. Well, this is not against the Bible when it speaks about alms because Christ in the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter says uh, or speaks about giving alms. In fact, Let's read it here. Okay. The book of Matthew chapter six, verse number, let's get it here. Let me get it here. Bah, 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 bah. Yes. Matthew chapter six, verse number two. Therefore, when thou doest, or at verse number one, take heed that ye do not take, uh, do your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, ye have no reward of your father, which is in heaven. Therefore, when you doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily, I say unto you that they have their reward. But when you doest thou alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thy alms may be in secret, and thy father, which is in secret, himself shall reward thee openly. So according to the Bible, not only does it speak about giving alms, it also lets you know that there is a reward that comes with giving alms. Okay? So the Bible or the book of Tobit is not against the Bible. There's other things that they go into, but that's another lesson for another day. But getting to the point, uh, here it says that alms deliver from death. Okay? Well, let's keep this in context. OK, let's keep this in context. Uh, let's go to uh, we may have to go to another chapter which speaks about alms. OK, but when you read on, um, in fact, let's read on here in verse number uh, chapter four of the book of Tobit, verse number 11, it says. For alms is a good gift unto all that give it in the sight of the most high. Beware of all whoredom. This is verse 12. My son. And chiefly take a wife of the seed of thy fathers, and take not a strange woman to wife, which is not of thy father's tribe. For we are the children of the prophets, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember, my son, that our fathers from the beginning, even that, even that they all married wives of their own kindred, and were blessed in their children, and their seed shall inherit the land. So basically the point I'm making is that uh, Tobit, is giving instruction to his son Tobias on how to live rightly. Okay, keep in mind within context, uh, Tobit is sending his son Tobias into the land of Media. 
So he's letting them know that as you go into the land of media, you have a responsibility to uphold righteousness. Okay, so he's giving him instruction on how to live amongst the Medes. And it shows you, and of course, there were Israelites scattered amongst the Medes, which is also documented in Tobit. But this shows you that we had a responsibility regardless of where we were, whether in Jerusalem, whether in Israel, whether amongst our own kindred, or if we were scattered amongst the other nations, we had a responsibility of upholding righteousness. We had a responsibility of being a light unto the people upon where we were scattered or where unto we were scattered. Okay. But getting to the point of your question, uh, if you give alms, um, but continue to uh, send, uh, let me get the, let me pull it up here so I can make sure I have the fullness of your question. Yes. What happens if you give alms, but continue to send? Keep in mind uh, the, the chapter we read in Tobit, as well as the other chapters that you can go back and read within the book of Tobit. Alms is always explained within the context of keeping the commandments. Okay. So it's not a thing where you simply give alms and that is a washing away of your sins or you just give alms and the most high will turn a blind eye to sin. You must give alms along with keeping the other commandments. Okay. So right after alms, he now goes into whoredom. He then goes into other things that uh, Tobias uh, must keep and must must live in uh, when it comes to uh, upholding righteousness. Now, uh, I'm going to jump over, okay, to another chapter in the book of Tobit. And let me read this here. Okay, Tobit, uh, this is chapter number 14. Okay. This is before Tobit passes away, and he's now instructing his sons on how to live righteously again amongst uh, not only the Ninevites, but also in the land of um, uh, the Medes. Uh, it says here, uh, let me get it. Yes, uh, this is chat. Uh, this is verse eight, uh, Tobit 14, verse eight. And now, my son, depart out of Nineveh, because that those things which thou uh, hast to profit, or of the things which the prophet Jonas spake, shall surely come to pass. But keep thou the law and the commandments, and show thyself merciful and just, that it may be well with thee. Now, let's jump down to verse number 11 in this same chapter. Okay, he just told his children to keep the commandments that it may be well with them in the land of the Medes. Now let's jump down to verse 11 in Tobit chapter 14. Wherefore now, my son, consider what alms doeth and how righteousness doeth deliver. So now he's speaking about alms again. When he had said these things, he gave up the ghost in his bed. So now Tobit passes away. So again, alms is always spoken within the full context of keeping God's commandments. Okay. So now what about someone who uh, consistently gives alms, but continues to break the commandments? Uh, let's go to uh, 1 Samuel 15. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse uh, number 22. Or, or, or let's start in verse number 21. But the people took the spoil of the sheep and oxen. This is Saul speaking. The chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Behold, to obey a form of sacrifice. It's you taking of your finances or taking of your resources and giving to those in need. OK, that is a form of a sacrifice. But the Bible says, behold, it is better. Or behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he have also rejected thee from being king. OK. So again, just to show an example of how 
Um, the most time would rather we obey than to break the commandments or sin and then come with a sacrifice, come with alms, uh, come with a gift. Okay. Uh, all right. Hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Tracy Michelle. Uh, someone says, how to deal with someone in the truth who passes judgment upon you and looks at you with an evil eye? Knowing you did nothing sinful against them, they hate you without cause. Is it okay to have them? It depends on the situation. And I say it depends on the situation because um, there's there's two sides to a story. Okay. There's two sides to a story. So when it comes to uh, judging a matter between brother or sister and sister or brother and sister, uh, you always have to have both sides of the perspective. Um, you, you're providing your side of the perspective, which um, is good. But first and foremost, it, it, of course, this, this would be a, a separate uh, situation that we would, would would have to counsel on, but nonetheless, we would have to get the other person's perspective to figure out. Okay, what is what is the origin origin of this hatred? If there is a hatred that exists, okay. Now, if it's found that there is a hatred that exists, then number one, the person who holds that hatred has to address and deal with that hatred, okay. That's after it's found that there is a, a, a hatred exists. This person does have an evil eye. This person is being despiteful against you, so on and so forth. Once that is proven and they acknowledge that, they now have to deal with that. Okay. In the midst of that, there's really nothing that you can do to stop this person from being hateful. Okay. There's nothing you can do to stop this person from being despiteful. All right. In fact, the only thing that is in your power to do is first and foremost, pray for the individual. OK, as Christ said, pray for them that despitefully use you. In fact, we're going to get that real quick. OK. This is the book of. Um, this is the book of Matthew. We're going to start here in Matthew, chapter five, uh, verse number. Let's see. Let's start in verse nine. It says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. OK, so the Bible is not the, the uh, Christ is showing us uh, the, the new and living way of how to honor and keep the most High's commandments. OK, uh, the most high is not uh, down with the spirit or the most high ab abhors the spirit of tell bearing and the spirit of keeping up controversies and keeping up arguments and uh, people keeping uh, what they would call, I guess, bad energy uh, between brother and sister. The Bible speaks about that, okay? How one would come in and, and bring um, any you know forms of tell bearing, they'll bring anything they can to keep people divided, okay? And that's one of the things that um, the Bible hates or, or the Bible says that the most high hates uh, holding this point and going to the book of Proverbs the uh, I believe the sixth chapter the six things which the most high do of hate okay let me see if this is it yes uh, Proverbs chapter 6 verse number 16 these six things do if the Lord hate yea Seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief. And that's an issue, a bad problem amongst the children of Israel. Uh, we love to run to mischief. 
okay? If there's a fight going on, if there's some form of controversy, some form of argument, uh, we're the first ones in line to get to that controversy in order to find a way to stir it up, to instigate it, to keep it going, to keep the fire burning. And it, it, it ends up someone being hurt, someone being shot. And then we walk away looking stupid with a stupid look on our face. Like, why is this always happening in our communities? Okay. Well, if you stop instigating, if you stop uh, putting fuel to the fire in these in these situations, maybe it will limit the, the amount of violence and the fatalities that take place in our community. Okay. But it goes on here and it says, so that's one key thing. The Bible says, uh, feet that be swift. In running to mischief. And then it goes on to say in verse 19, a false witness that speak of lies and he that saw discord among brethren. So the Bible or the most high hates one that saw of discord amongst brethren, one who comes in and plants seeds of separation. So now Christ says, building upon that wisdom of the Old Testament and the commandments, he says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God those who are against sowing discord among brethren, those who are against running to mischief and things of that nature. Uh, but going on to verse 10, it says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So with that, again, you've brought your cause, you've brought your side of the story. But again, we have to get the other side of the story. Okay. And that's, this is not just you. This is just in general. This is for everyone. Because this person may have a hatred against you, but the question is why? This person may be uh, despising you or acting despitefully against you. Not saying it's right, but you have to ask the question why? Is it something you did to this person? And that's why it's important and needful to get the other side of the conversation. Because they'll come and they'll say, well, the reason that this has been so, or whatever the case may be, is because you did this, that, and the third. Again. Not saying that's right. If there was an issue, if it was an offense, Matthew 18 and 15 tells us how to address that offense. But nonetheless, we we have you have to always get two sides of the story in these types of situations. Um, it says, um, blessed are ye when men, this is verse 11 in the book of Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say, all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. So if they're persecuting you and coming against you for Christ's sake and you did nothing to them, that's a different situation. Okay? That's a different scenario, which comes with uh, counsel or scriptures which deal with that. But if it's not for Christ's sake, if it was actually something that was done against the individual, then that's another story. Okay? Verse number 12, it says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So the prophets were being persecuted, not because of uh, things they did personally against people or uh, people coming against them for personal issues or whatever the case may be. It was the prophets going out and doing the most size will, okay? Going out and giving the unadulterated truth. And speaking, whether the people would hear and forbear, what made which made them enemies uh, or public enemies, number one, or enemies of the public. Okay. Um, let's uh, blah, blah, blah. let's jump over. Uh, Matthew chapter five, verse number 43. You have heard that have been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. So let's say that this person is acting in the form or coming in the form of an enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you and do good unto them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and send of rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do, do not even the publicans the same. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? 
do not even the publicans so? Publicans uh, meaning tax collectors. Okay, these were people of the world. So now that question often comes in, well, uh, does this only apply to those in the truth or with people in the world? Okay, this also applies to people in the world. But you have to understand, as, as, as Christ said, that the, the children uh, of the world are wiser uh, than the children of light in this generation. So um, those who are in the world have many trains, they have many devices, they have many machinations to use and abuse, so on and so forth. Again, to get the fullness of what that is, that will take counsel. Okay, but if it's someone in the truth who was who was aware of these principles, then um, it should be an easier situation. I say should with a capital S H. Okay, because it's not always the case, but it should be an easier situation to deal with if someone is all already acknowledging uh, these particular principles. But this is what Christ requires of us for those who despitefully or deal despitefully against us. Okay. Now, again, if a council were to take place and it's founded that this individual is acting hatefully and despitefully and evil against you, then that person has to now take those steps uh, to root that hatred and that envy out of themselves. Okay, they must now take the step forward to acknowledge their wrong, as it tells us in Matthew, the 18th chapter, the 15th verse, if they acknowledge their wrong. Acknowledging is the first step. They apologize, and then they must work on fixing the issue. Okay? So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, someone says, what is the difference on how we keep time versus the discovery in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, it's, it's, it's pretty much similar, okay? 364-day uh, calendar, 364-day um, uh, calendar, 13 weeks in, within each season, uh, 30 days uh, within a particular season. You have two days, which are 30, or two months, which are 30 days, one month, which is uh, 30 days, plus one intercalary day, which brings in the season. So 30, 30, 31, okay? So it's, it's very uh, similar to what was kept uh, or what is discussed in those particular records, okay? And we base the understanding mainly upon the Book of Enoch as well as the Book of Jubilees when it comes to the cycling of the calendar, okay? Those, those records were also, I believe, fragments of those records were also found uh, uh, within the, amongst the Dead Sea discoveries, okay? Uh, trying to find out more about GOCC. I am in New Jersey by Philadelphia. What you can do is send an email to um, gathering as one, the number one at AOL.com, and we'll make sure that your information is forwarded over to the uh, the proper place. We'll make sure it's forwarded over to Philadelphia. Just make sure you mention that uh, you are searching fellowship within the Philadelphia area. Uh, Elderwood herbs, do we take? Uh, to relax and sleep at night. I am not an herbalist by any stretch of the imagination, but through experience, I know that chamomile and lavender are very good herbs to take uh, to rest and relax at night. Okay. Uh, chamomile and lavender. All right. Of course, you, you have to do the research to make sure that you're not allergic to any of those things. I'm not here to give any form of, um, I guess you would say, uh, health advice to try to tell you and, you know, to go take this and then you have an adverse reaction. Of course, it's herbs, the most high made herbs out of the earth. And let me make this clear. OK, when we speak of herbs, we're speaking of rosemary, oregano, parsley, mint. OK flowers like chamomile and lavender and things of that nature. Okay. We're not talking about the, uh, the, the sticky icky as some will call it. Okay. Because anything that says herb, we know our people will jump on it. Okay. Like a ham sandwich. 
So we're going to make sure we make this clear that when we read this particular scripture, that this is speaking specifically like uh, this is speaking specifically of herbs that the most high made for human consumption for meat. OK. Uh, this is Syrac. This is Syrac chapter 38. Uh, it says, and this is verse one, honor a physician with the honor due unto him for the uses which he, uh, which ye have made of him for the Lord have created him. Speaking about a righteous physician, not a physician who is operating, uh, dealing with pharmaceuticals, uh, mind altering drugs, um, what they call them, psychotropics and things of that nature. Even though we acknowledge there are brothers and sisters who are in that field that is their uh, place of employment, okay? We understand that every person who is in that field is not trying to harm people or been operating in that field before they knew the truth, okay? We understand all of those things. But the overall construct of the pharmaceutical industry was not built upon the concept or for the purpose of helping the people or healing the people. It was made for the purpose of creating repeat customers, okay? The pharmaceutical business is a business. The pharmaceutical industry is an industry. And the last I checked, if I'm not mistaken, a multi-billion, if not a multi-trillion dollar industry, okay? So the physicians of this earth, for some of them unbeknownst to themselves, they may not know. They may just follow the science or follow the report that was placed on their desk and or, you know, some some pharmaceutical company offered to, to send them to Hawaii for a trip or promised to pay their children through college if they promoted a particular drug. And they decided to do so. No questions asked. OK, but again, the overall construct of the pharmaceutical business and industry is to create repeat customers. OK, also, there is a spiritual side to this. Where the Bible speaks about witchcraft in the New Testament, the book of Galatians, the fifth chapter. When you look up that word witchcraft, it's pharmakia, which is where you get the word pharmacy from. OK, so this is the spiritual side to this also. But just dealing on this level, uh, uh, bringing it back to the scriptures, it says in uh, Ecclesiastes 38 and 1, honor a physician with the honor due unto him. For the uses which ye have, which ye have of him, for the Lord hath created him. So the Most High created the physician who deals with herbs and things of that nature. And this particular uh, physician that the Most High is dealing with is one that is rooted in Scripture, because you have many herbalists, and we discussed, we touched on this just a little bit on last week's radio show. A lot of the uh, herbalists and uh, those who are prom promoting the vegetarianism and the raw food diet and all these, these different things that you may find within our community, the health food restaurant, all of those things are good. But it just so happens that in this day and age, it's like the uh, occult world, uh, those who deal in magic, whether they call it white magic, black magic, whatever the, the case may be, voodoo, so on and so forth. A voodoo, as some people may say, oh, voodoo is the white man's word. Voodoo, whatever it is, is witchcraft according to the Bible, whatever you call it. But nonetheless, those who deal in that world, it seems that they have a monopoly on uh, health food or the, I guess you would say, the, um, the homeopathic healing world. OK, when you want to go and you're looking for someone who's dealing uh, with a health food restaurant, it's someone who their basis or their spiritual foundation is yoga. Okay. Or within the black community, uh, you go to a, a place where they, they may sell uh, smoothies and fruit smoothies, and they may sell different supplements for health. All of those things are good, but the spiritual basis of the person who owns the shop or is over the shop is someone who deals with African spiritualism, cold word for a witch. Okay. Um, so it seems like in this world, the people who deal in that realm of quote unquote health 
a majority of, I want to say almost 95% of the time, when you run into these people, they are dealing in some form of the occult. There's a small percentage of people and 95% that, that may be over exaggeration or may be conservative, depending on your experiences. But there's a small percentage of those who actually are rooted in the Bible when it comes to uh, health, uh, when it comes to homeopathic healing. Um, we, we know of brothers and sisters amongst the body who are rooted in the Bible, uh, who deal with the, the herbs and things of that nature. And we have, we have to again be very careful because even with that, people who have come into the truth and deal with the, the herbs and things of that nature, many of them come from a background of African spiritualism and, and yoga and all these different foreign um, ideologies. Okay. And if they're not, and, and some brothers and sisters, they still carry that, those philosophies into the truth and try to, mi try to mix those things that they learned in yoga and that they learned in the Native American uh, spiritual beliefs or the African spiritual beliefs, and they try to marry it with scripture. Okay. So again, with that, you, you have to be careful with that also. But again, making this point, the physician that this Bible is speaking of, or the scripture is speaking of, is a physician that is rooted in the Bible. So going on, it says here, verse number two, uh, for the most high, for of the most high come of healing, and he shall receive honor of the king. Speaking about the physician. So the healing that we're speaking of is the healing that comes from the Most High. And a righteous physician who acknowledges that healing comes from the Most High acknowledges also that there's nothing that he can do with his herbs. There's nothing that he can do with his diet plan that is not rooted and founded in the wisdom of the Most High. Even those who deal with the voodoo and the yoga, if they deal with a diet, and deal with supplements that the Most High gave, they're still reaping the benefits of the Most High's creation. It's the Most High in Genesis, the first chapter, that uh, made uh, herbs of the earth, okay? Fruit bearing seeds, okay? Which seed is in itself, which now gives it the capability to yield more fruit, okay? The Most High in his wisdom made those things, okay? not the Orishas and all these other things that people are into, not the goddess spirit, not Aphrodite and uh, not Buddha and all these different things that our people are into. They did not create those fruits. The Most High did. So even those who deal with the diet and they do reap the benefits of it are reaping the benefits of the Most High's wisdom and power of healing. Okay? But even with that, there's only so far you can go without linking into the Most High as a physician, okay? Verse number three says, the skill of the physician shall lift up his head, and in the sight of great men, he shall be had in great admiration, or he shall be in admiration. The Lord hath created medicines out of the earth, and he that is wise shall not abhor them, okay? So medicines were created from the earth, herbs rosemary, parsley, mint, okay? Astrologous and all these other things that you may go and you may find. Uh, you have uh, fruits like baobab and, you know, honeysuckle and, you know, cantaloupe and watermelon and uh, bananas, all these different things that the Mosai have allowed to come forth of the earth, which can be used for healing, okay? Flowers like rose, like chamomile, like lavender, Okay, like green tea, so on and so forth. And uh, I got to make this disclaimer. Again, of course, based on your train of thought, the philosophy and the world you came from before you came into the truth, you may have a different opinion as to what herbs are good or what herbs are not good, what fruits are good, what fruits are not good. Some people will tell you, listen, don't eat bananas because bananas they are the devil or something like that. Like they were created in a, you know, people are going to all kinds of things when it comes to, to you know, their particular uh, root or their particular foundation as to how they learned about diet and health. Okay. But 
all praises be to the Most High, he made it very simple by giving us a dietary law and actually making mention of some of the things that uh, we actually have access to in this time, like fruits and certain herbs and things of that nature. OK, so I don't have to speculate. I don't have to depend on this individual or that individual to tell me what I can eat, what I can't eat, because the Bible makes it clear. OK. And you may you may notice I'm making a lot of disclaimers, but keep in mind that I, I do have to answer emails. And I know after this, I'm going to get some emails as after any lesson, we get emails. They come in and they ask, what about this? So sometimes I may be long winded when answering some of these questions. But I have to keep in mind to make things easier for myself that I have to try to answer as many aspects of the question as possible. OK. Uh, so moving forward, it says here, um, verse number six, and he have given men skill that he might or uh, verse number five was not water made sweet with wood. That the virtue thereof might be known. So that's going back to the book of Exodus, where the Most High made the uh, bitter waters drinkable uh, by putting a tree in the water. OK. Uh, it says here, and he that and he have given men skill that he might be honored in his marvelous works with such do if he heal men and take for wounds. of such do if the apothecary make a confection and of his works, there is no end. And from him is peace over all the earth. OK, then it goes into instruction of when you do become sick, how to address your sickness. OK, it starts off by saying, my son and thy sickness be not negligent. Then it goes into going before the most high, praying, repenting and then going to a physician to now get a remedy uh, to begin the process of healing your body. Uh, someone says Satan supposedly fell because he didn't want to bow down to Adam. However, you're saying that angels rebelled and were confined to the earth before Adam was even created. Uh, can you clear up the confusion? Uh, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> with the information that's presented and that 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 information as far as Satan uh, being cast down. Because he didn't want to bow to Adam comes from the record. Uh, called the life of Adam and Eve. OK, and that's one record that provides a perspective as to why um, uh, Satan fell. OK, that provides a perspective. And this is this is the thing we we often run into when you when you have different records. And sometimes these different records will have a different account of the same situation. OK, or of the same scenario. OK, so the book of Adam and Eve states that and there's many examples of that we can go into either between the Bible and, uh, you know, some of the other records or between the book of Jasher and the book of Jubilees you may go into them and find differences of account on one particular situation. OK, now, when it comes to the fall of Satan, OK, dealing strictly with the um, the mentioning or the the precepts within the Bible. OK, within the Bible, it gives the understanding that Satan fell before the time of Adam. OK, it says here in the book of Jeremiah four and twenty three. OK. Jeremiah four and twenty three. Uh, in fact, going to verse number. 20, it says, I beheld and lo. There was no man and all the birds of the heaven were fled. OK, so this is speaking of a time before there was man, before man came into the earth or man came on the scene. We're seeing a situation where it's making mention of a fault of Lucifer and angels or Satan and his angels, as are mentioned in Revelations 12. OK, so hopefully that answers your question. OK. Again, in any situation where there may be uh, two different accounts or what have you, we must lean on the Bible. OK, we must go with the Bible first. Mm -hmm. 
That scripture in Ecclesiastes 1 was Ecclesiastes 1 and 18. Um, someone says, is that why Christ was considered a man of many sorrows? Um, I'm assuming that's in relation to the scripture we read earlier about he that increase of wisdom, uh, increase of sorrow. And that, that maybe was one aspect of his uh, of the sorrows. But the main thing is that he came into this earth uh, to be a sacrifice for a people who did not desire a, a, a righteous sacrifice, who did not desire his labor of love. OK, so there were there were many things that contributed to the, the sorrows of, of Christ. OK. And I believe that uh, those sorrows are mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. OK, Isaiah, chapter 53, verse three, it says he is despised, speaking of Christ and rejected of men. OK a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So this is explaining why he was a man of sorrows. And of course, he was all wise, all under, you know, all understanding and knowing that he had foresight to know what was to befall these people that he came for. Like um, it mentions, I believe in Luke 19, that Christ uh, wept uh, when he saw the city of Jerusalem because the people didn't know or had no clue what was to um, befall them, okay, with the destruction of 70 AD. I'm going to read this real quick in uh, St. Luke 19 and 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known even thou, at least in this, uh, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy place, but now they are hid from thine eyes. So the people had no clue what was to befall them. But Christ knew. Christ understood. And for those who followed Christ, he gave them warning of the peril that would come upon Jerusalem. Okay? So that was, that was also an aspect of his sorrows, seeing and knowing what our people were going, going to go through with this last captivity understanding it but then st still seeing the um how the people despised him how the people rejected the okay we're going back to isaiah 53 explaining why he was a man of sorrows isaiah 53 and 3 he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him he was despised and we esteemed him not so this is what contributed mainly to christ being a man of sorrow okay Uh, let's see here. Uh, someone says, I'm reading the book of Jasher, chapter 3, verses 15. It says, great mourning and weeping became the custom. What was the custom before that? And in verse 32, where did they go? Okay, let me pull up the book of Jasher. All right. Um, let me see here. All right. Let me pull up the book of Jasher. You said chapter three, verse number 15. Okay. Uh, let's start in verse number 14. And it was in the 56th year of the life of Lamech when Adam died, 930 years old was he at his death. 
and his two sons with Enoch and Methuselah, his son, buried him with a great pomp, as at the burial of kings, in the cave which God had told him. And in that place the sons of men made a great mourning and weeping on account of Adam. It has therefore become a custom amongst the sons of men to this day. And Adam died because he ate of the tree of knowledge and his children after him as the Lord had spoken. Okay, so you, and then also verse 32. And after this, that he rose up and rode upon the horse and went forth and the sons of men went after him, about 800,000 men, and they went with him one day's journey. And the second day, well, this is speaking about Enoch um, revealing himself uh, to the, or uh, Enoch before his ascension, basically, going into detail of him going before the sons of men and teaching the sons of men. And uh, uh, eventually, uh, slowly but surely, pulling back with his appearances before the sons of men, before he was actually taken up. Okay. Now we're going to answer both of those questions. Uh, what did men do before that? I'm assuming you're asking, did men mourn death before that? Okay. Uh, let's see here. Let's go to the book of Genesis four. Okay, Genesis chapter four. Okay. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel? This is verse nine. Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which have opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, because thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth and from the from thy face shall I be hid and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Uh, getting down to the point. Uh, verse number 19. And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of one was Adah and the name of the other Zillah. And Adah bare Jabal he was the father of such as dwell in tents and of such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all that handle as, as such as handle the harp and organ. In Zillah also she bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. And Lamech said unto his wives, Adah and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech. For I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. Now, this is going into uh, which uh, the book of Jasher identifies as uh, the death of both Cain and Tubal Cain. Cain being uh, one of the fathers or the distant fathers of Lamech and Tubal Cain being the son of Lamech. So when he says, uh, I have slain a man in my wounding or to my wounding. And a young man to my hurt. The man is speaking about Cain, and the young man is Tubal Cain. Verse 24 says, Now, the reason why he's stating this, uh, he goes back to his wives, he states this, and then afterwards, his wives um, are naturally they're angered because not only did he kill Cain, but he also killed uh, their son. Okay. So this that at that point that can be seen as a form of mourning. But I can only assume, and I would do further research into the, the story in Jasher, I can only assume that when it speaks about men mourned in that fashion, okay, I can only assume it's in resemblance to what was done at the death of Joseph or what was done at the, the death of Jacob, where all men come together of a city, of a village or what have you, and they all mourn the death of an individual, okay? 
The example we have in the Bible, again, is the death of Joseph. I believe also the death of Jacob was very similar, where all men came and they mourned him uh, for uh, an extended period of time. Okay, let me see if I can get those stories. So this is uh, the book of Genesis chapter. Let's start in chapter 50. Okay. Uh, this is chapter 50, verse number 10. This is after the death of Jacob. Okay. And they came to the threshing floor of Atod, which is beyond Jordan, and they mourned with a great mourning, great and sore lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. And when the inhabitants of the land of Canaan saw the mourning in the floor of Atod, they said, this is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Wherefore they named, uh, the name of it was Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. And his sons did unto him. In fact, let's go. Let's go to uh, Genesis chapter fifty, verse three. And forty days were fulfilled for him, for so all uh, are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned him for three score and ten days. So the Egyptians mourned uh, Jacob for forty days. Okay. So this is more than just maybe an individual or just a family mourning over an individual this is men coming together either from your nation or other in this case we have uh, joseph who is uh second in command of of egypt and had great influence amongst the egyptians so once his father dies not only do the israelites mourn but also the egyptians mourn the death of jacob okay so maybe it's in reference to uh it says where it says in uh, verse 15 that men after that day began to mourn after those who die maybe it's speaking about uh mourning in great number or people coming to what you would consider maybe a funeral and mourning the death of an individual but of course i'll do more biblical research to see um if that's actually the first case or the first place in which men mourned uh just in case people may come across that information as well uh, as far as the second point, uh, where did the 800,000 men go? Uh, let's see here. Where did the 800,000 men go? Going back to Jasher chapter 3, verse 32. In fact, I'll speak, I'll, I'll read verse 31 first. And all the sons of men assembled and came to Enoch that day, and all the kings of the earth with their princes and counselors remain with him that day and enoch then taught the sons of men wisdom and knowledge and gave them divine instruction and he bade them to serve the lord and to walk in his ways all the days of their life and he continued to make peace amongst them and it was after this that he rose up and rode upon the horse and he went forth and all the sons of men went after him about eight hundred thousand men and they went with him about a day's journey and on the second day he said to them return home to your tents why will ye go? Perhaps you may die. And some of them went from him, and those that remained with, went with him about six days' journey. And Enoch said to them every day, Return ye to your tents, lest ye die. But they were not willing to return, and they went with him. So the question is, where did they go? They were following Enoch. The same way the apostles and the disciples were following Christ when Christ went on his journeys, his one-day journeys, his three-day journeys, his apostles would go with him, okay? So Enoch, in this case, he's telling these men, listen, go back to your tents, go back to your homes. You may die on this journey, okay? You had some who decided to go back to their homes, and you had others who decided uh, to um, remain with Enoch, okay? And it goes on and on within that story, but that's that's, that's simply what that is. Those are men following Enoch, following his teachings, so on and so forth, the same way the apostles followed Christ. Uh, 
Uh, someone says, just to clear up some confusion I have encountered, are we supposed to keep the feast days in captivity or Jerusalem? I love the feast days. Can you provide scriptures? Uh, absolutely. Okay. We'll start with the law, uh, which commands us to keep the com or to keep the holy days in Jerusalem. I'll start there first before we move forward. Okay. Let's see here. Let's go to the book of Exodus, I believe, where it makes mention of those holy days that required us to go to Jerusalem. One moment, bear with me. Let me pull it up here. We're going to deal first with the scriptures which make keeping the holy days in Jerusalem. Yes, uh, Exodus, the 23rd chapter. Exodus 23 and verse number 14. Exodus 23 and 14 says, Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days, as I commanded thee in the appointed month of Aviv. For in it thou camest out from the land of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. In the feast of the harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in thy field, and the feast of the end gathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in the labors out of the field. Three times in the year, all thy mill shall appear before the Lord God. Okay, appear before the Lord God, meaning going up to Jerusalem. But we'll get one that's more distinct when it comes to going to the land which the Most High severed out or chose for his name. Okay, Deuteronomy 16, verse 16 says, Three times a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. We know eventually that place that he chose was Jerusalem. It says here, uh, In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, they shall not appear before the Lord empty. So yes, initially when we were established, we were supposed to keep the holy days in Jerusalem. Okay. But what happened? Of course, we became scattered throughout the four corners of the earth. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 64 says, And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the one end of the earth, even unto the other. And there thou shalt serve other gods, which neither thy nor thy fathers have known, even wood and stone. We go over to the book of First Kings, just to give an example of what we were commanded to do even after being scattered. It says here, First Kings, the eighth chapter. Okay. First Kings, chapter eight. I'll start in verse number, getting straight to the point. I'll start in verse number 44. If thy people go out to battle against their enemy, whithersoever thou shalt send them, and shall pray unto the Lord toward the city which thou hast chosen, and toward the house 
that, that I have built for thy name, then hear thou it in heaven, their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause. If, thy, if they sin against thee, which we did, for there is no man that sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, which the Mosai was, and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away captives, which took place, unto the land of the enemy far and near. Yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land, whither they were carried captives, both far and near, and repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carry them away captives. So it didn't say make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem in those times. It says to remember Jerusalem or remember the land and the places in which they were carried away captive, saying, we have sinned and have done perversely. We have committed wickedness and so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul and the land of their enemies, which led them away captive and pray unto thee toward their land which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, which is Jerusalem. So here it is, we're outside of Jerusalem in the land of our enemies, both far and near, acknowledging the Most High God. Okay? Acknowledging the Most High God. And then for those who ask the question, why do we face the East or why do we face Jerusalem when we pray? Well, this is the scripture which uh, gives that particular uh, ordinance. Uh, but getting back to the point, this is showing us acknowledging the Most High in the places of our captivity. Okay. So it says here, then hear thou their prayer and supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. And forgive thy people that have sinned against thee in all their transgressions wherein they have transgressed against thee, and give them compassion uh, before them who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. For they be thy people and thy inheritance, which thou broughtest forth out of Egypt from the midst of the, fi the furnace of fire. Okay, so we're in the land of our, our captives, both far and near. So the Most High says, turn to his holy place, turn to Jerusalem and remember him, acknowledge him. Okay, so no, we don't have to go to Jerusalem in order to celebrate the holy days in this time. Okay. We're not required to. If you decide to, that's your business. Okay, but we're not required to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the holy days. Okay, we can acknowledge the holy days and keep the holy days and acknowledge the Most High on those holy days in the lands in which we've been scattered. Okay. When was the woman really created? Uh, let, let's let's read it. Uh, the book of Genesis, the first chapter. Genesis 1 and 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his image. Now this man is Adam, the same man in the book of Genesis 2 and 7. Um, this is not mankind being created on the first day. This is not womankind being created on the first day. This is Adam and Eve being created on the first day. The second chapter just recounts what was created on the first day and goes into detail of the man and woman that were created on the first day. So God created man in his image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So the Mosai made both male and female on the first or on the sixth day of creation. Genesis, the second chapter, goes into detail of how that woman was created on the sixth day of creation. Okay. Will the Gentiles accompany the Israelites in the wilderness? The answer is yes. Okay. There will be Gentiles in the wilderness. Okay. Let me read it here. Uh, 
Isaiah chapter 14, verse number two or verse number one. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and will set them in their own land. And the strangers shall be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. So the strangers will be joined unto the house of Jacob, even in the wilderness. No different than when we came out of Egypt. You had the Israelites who left the land of Egypt and you had strangers amongst the Israelites when they left the land of Egypt. Okay. Verse number two, it says, and the people, meaning and the Gentiles, shall take them and bring them to their place. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. OK, so just to make it uh, short, uh, the Gentiles will be um, in the wilderness with the Israelites. Uh, is there a church in L.A.? Uh, yes. What you can do is send an email to gathering as one, the number one at AOL.com. Is Ishtel the offspring, Ishtar an offspring of informal? Did the with angels hatch men from eggs? Could there be any truth to that? Who was that this person? Um, I'm, I'm, I've never heard of women laying eggs to hatch. Okay, if you have any information on that. I'll be more than welcome to hear, you know, of course, uh, in regard to, you know, or of course, keeping in mind where the information is coming from. But I've, I've never heard that particular um, concept. OK. Um, a lot of what uh, is kept as tradition uh, through Easter and things of that nature, um, a lot of those things are uh, they're more so legends that were. That, that came about or uh, or traditions that were added through time unto a, a particular tradition or legend, okay? So now the eggs become more so synonymous with fertility than actually, you know, men coming from eggs and things of that nature, okay? Uh, God said, let's make them in our image. Uh, yes, them being male and female, man and woman. OK, two two people automatically. Them is a um, a second person pronoun. OK, a second person plural pronoun. So anytime you have more than one person being referred to in the second person, uh, they refer to as them or they. OK, for in order for the, for it to be them or they, it doesn't have to be a hundred thousand people or a million people. It just simply has, has to be more than one person. And in the case of Genesis 1 and 26 and 27, we're dealing with more than one person, not just male, but also female. They were both created on day number six. Again, Genesis 2 and 7 now goes into detail of how that woman was created on day number six. OK. Uh, someone says, my son was murdered in December. Is it wrong for me to do things in remembrance of him? Uh, the answer is no. OK, if you decide to rem remember your son, uh, you know, either a memorial, wh whatever the case may be, that's that's, you know, that's your prerogative. That's your business. You know, there's nothing wrong with doing with doing with doing so. Salakia. OK, even in scripture, you have memorials or remembrances of someone who may have passed away in the past. Okay. Does the full armor of God protect us from spells and dark arts? The answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, what kind of fish did Tobit use to get rid of evil spirits from his future wife? And would it be effective today? Or should we just ask God for that protection from, from evil spirits? Um, the scripture doesn't in Tobit, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's been a while since I've read the, the actual account, but I don't believe it goes into the actual type of fish that it was that Tobit caught. OK, now I can go go back and read it and see if it actually makes mention of the type of fish that it was. But I don't recollect it actually mentioning the specific type of fish. 
Now, the second question being, should we do that today? And the answer is no. Okay. No more than we would uh, perform a uh, animal sacrifice today or sacrifice a bullock today in the same way that it was done in the Old Testament. Okay. Taking the bull and pulling out the innards and burning them on, the, on an altar, so on and so forth. We wouldn't do those things either because Christ is now our sacrifice. And in the same way that Christ is our sacrifice, Christ is also the one who, through his name, through his power, we cast out demons. We cast out spirits. Okay? So hopefully that answers your question concerning that. Okay? Yeah, so what I'll do is I'll go back over the book of Tobit and see if it makes mention of the fish. But I don't think it mentions it by name. OK, and again, that's one of the things that people will look at in the book of Tobit and say, well, the book of Tobit must be a false book because it promotes uh, this form of ritual or this is witchcraft or so on and so forth. But when you read what was done in Tobit is really no different than what was done by the priest in the Old Testament for sacrifice. OK, there were many things that we did before Christ uh, for healing and things of that nature that we do not do after Christ. Uh, for example, um, and this, you know, this is something that, you know, this is a universal understanding that music has healing power and there's nothing wrong with uh, listening to music for uh, re relaxation or um, to, you know, just relax, uh, to soothe yourself. There's nothing wrong with that. So don't think I'm saying that by any stretch of the imagination. But Saul had a demon on him. Okay. The comfort of the, of the Most High had left him. Now, usually in the New Testament with Christ, you will see a situation if someone has a demon, if someone is dealing with the spirit, hands will be laid on that person and they would be healed of that demon. But instead, someone suggested to Saul that David come in and play the harp to soothe Saul. Okay. And it says that when he played it, that evil spirit of the Lord departed from him. Now, again, music does have a form of healing power, soothing, relaxing, uh, a relaxing effect. OK. But just to show you the difference between some of the things we did in the Old Testament, which were cons <coughs> considered for the purpose of. <coughs> excuse me which were considered for the purpose of either healing or soothing and things of that nature, opposed to what we would do in the New Testament. Okay, now making mention of this because, again, people will make these arguments against the book of Tobit, but um, <clears throat> a lot of that can be uh, rectified through the, through, the, through the Bible, both Old and New Testament. Uh, says then it says that man was made from the rib yes genesis the second chapter tells us that eve was made from adam's rib so again on genesis in genesis the first chapter is telling us about the creation the overview of the creation of man and woman then again genesis chapter 2 is going into the detail of how that woman was created and poured from the man Okay, if you have any personal questions, you can send an email to glccsouth at yahoo.com along with your contact, and I'll get back with you as soon as possible. All right. Uh, we don't currently have a congregation in Memphis. Um, right now, we're looking, as far as Florida goes, we're looking to um, branch out mainly right now to Orlando. Okay. Uh, someone says, can women teach children in the church? The answer is yes. If there is a children's program or Sabbath program set up where the woman is separately teaching the children, which we do have um, in different locations within our church, uh, where we do have uh, the children's ministry where, you know, normally children would be in the sanctuary with everyone else, with the adults, 
But we know sometimes children, they get a little, you know, you know, they get antsy, they get fidgety. And after a while, it, it, it disturbs. Well, well, yes, that's the best word I can use or find. It disturbs the sermon or disturbs those who may be listening to the sermon to some degree. So we do have in those cases, children's ministries where the children can go and they can also learn at their pace. They can be more in your of age and also has experience when it comes to dealing and teaching with children, patients and things of that nature, because they know how to engage the children. Whereas we, you know, it's just precept upon precept, line upon line, so on and so forth. And after a while, children, you know, they, they can't really take to that. They just, they get antsy and fidgety. They want to move around. So yes, women can teach children in a separate environment. Okay. The Bible specifically says in the book of First uh, Timothy, the second chapter, that a woman is not to usurp authority over a man and that he suffers not a woman to teach. Well, the question is, in what environment? In a church setting, in a church environment, meaning that a woman is not going to conduct the Sabbath service. A woman is not going to conduct the Wednesday night class or whatever classes that are taking place over the general body. But a woman is still buffering. Okay, okay. So I have confirmation that it's not still buffering. Okay. All right. So again, if you're still interested in joining the academy, please feel free to send an email to gathering as one, the number one at AOL.com. Or you can go to our website, uh, historytimes.org, uh, which contains information on how to, uh, or you can actually enroll directly from that site. Also, if you're still interested in our Hebrew calendars, uh, we still have uh, some calendars left. So if you would like, you can send an email to, again, gathering as one at AOL.com to order your Hebrew calendar for 2019. Um, last but not least, I want to put up and request a special prayer request. Okay. I'm going to put this in the chat. Okay. Um, if you can see there, we have, I just put it in, in the chat in case when some people's in is buffering and they don't get this message. I want to make sure this message gets out to everyone as, as, or as much people as possible. Uh, we're requesting that a special prayer uh, be put up for Sister Phyllis King for strength and for health. Okay. For healing. Okay. If you can, the Sabbath, please just take some time out of your Sabbath of your day to put up a prayer for Sister Phyllis King. Okay, in fact, when we do our closing prayer, we, we are also gonna put up a prayer for her as we close out on the Sabbath Q&A, okay? So with that, if there's any more questions, you can send an email to gathering as one, the word one, at AOL.com, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. And uh, for those who are in the academy, we will be seeing you tomorrow, if it be the Lord's will, okay? so. Let's close out with the Lord's Prayer. Ahaya Bahashim Yashai Wabawak. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <clears throat> thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The water, Amun. Heavenly Father, we humbly present ourselves before your throne to thank you for the mercy and grace that you bestowed upon us all. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for blessing us all with the uh, opportunity to enter and to, to see another Sabbath. 
We pray, Heavenly Father, that all the burdens of this prior week be lifted from off our shoulders, that our minds, that our hearts, that our spirits may all have rest, Heavenly Father, on the Sabbath. We also ask, Heavenly Father, for the healing of Sister Phyllis King. We ask, Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit be an anointing of her, Heavenly Father, throughout all her extremities. May your Holy Spirit breathe life into her, Heavenly Father, that she may be healed in the name of your only begotten Son, Yeshua. We ask, Heavenly Father, for her healing, not for our righteousness' sake, Heavenly Father, but for your mercy's sake, for your healing's sake, for your power's sake. In the name of your Son, Yeshua, Heavenly Father, we ask for the healing of Sister Phyllis King. May your will be done, Heavenly Father. In the name of your Son, Yeshua, we thank you. Amen. All right. So, brothers and sisters, when you get the opportunity, again, uh, keep the sister in your prayer for, again, health, sound health and healing. And um, until next time, we want to say bless you all and shalom.